Hello from London and welcome to Leaders Live. I'm David Kushnan. This is Cameron McDonald and welcome along to the show. We're live on LinkedIn, on Twitter and we're on demand. And you can get in touch via at Leaders Biz on Twitter or by commenting underneath the live feed you're watching on LinkedIn. And if you prefer email, try studio at leadersinsport.com. On today's show, we are taking a look at gamification. What does it mean? What are the best use cases and how can you make it work for you? We'll be joined live by Nick Rend, Managing Director of Gaming and Esports at NASCAR, and by Guillaume Collard, Eleven Group Chief Rights Acquisitions and Distributions Officer, as well as the Managing Director of Eleven Belgium and Luxembourg. But first, David, I think we just have time to go over some of the things that have been going on in the sports industry. Indeed, we do. And since we were last with you on Leaders Live all the way back in November, we've had Leaders Meet Qatar, our first summit out of Doha, where we enjoyed a deep dive on topics ranging from hosting the World Cup to growing Asia's largest global sports media property and pretty much everything in between. If you're registered, you can still watch any of the 14 sessions from the two days on our Leaders Direct platform. I particularly enjoyed hearing from FIFA, from Colin Smith, and from the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, Nasser al Qatar, on the latest preparations for the World Cup, which will, of course, be taking place at this time next year. It was a very engaging session. Always engaging to hear from FIFA. I personally enjoyed FIFA's Pierluigi Kalina and Johannes Holzmuller discussing the evolution of refereeing in football, uh, where we heard not only about the introduction of VAR at the 2018 World Cup, but the new technology we have to look forward to seeing in 2022. We also had Chatri Sityotong, chairman and CEO of Group One, that's one championship, talking about how the tournament will change the world. So the ability to influence, the ability to change the world is immense. Just in the same way, Qatar World Cup is going to change the world in many, many, many ways. Of course, as the world's most watched World Cup in history, but it will put Qatar on the map, Middle East on the map, it will change perceptions, break down walls and create new bridges for economic prosperity for all. Also on stage with us in Doha, in that snazzy studio, we had a fantastic session where we heard Fatma al Ghanim from the Qatar Triathlon Federation, Lolwa al Mari, the president of the Qatar Women's Sport Committee, and World Cup 2022 Communications Executive Director Fatma al Nuaimi talk about what makes a great leader and how to leave a legacy for the next generation. Uh, it starts by uh, loving yourself, self love, so that you can have the empathy to uh, expect the most out of yourself and bring others along the way. Yeah. Maybe believe in yourself and challenge yourself as well. Atma? Um, for me, I think commitment and discipline is important because I think there is a lot of moments when you're, you're where you're, uh, there's low moments, there's high moments, but I mean like continuing and the discipline, I think this is what actually would inspire yourself and inspire everyone to continue. All in all, a fantastic event covering all sorts of areas. And again, you can catch any of the sessions on demand via the Leaders Direct platform. Now, a couple of other items worth noting from the sports industry over the past few weeks and days, including the news that Avram Glazer, most well known as chairman and owner of Manchester United, has expanded into cricket, purchasing a team in the new UAE 2020 league. Yes, an intriguing move this, and we can expect more news, I think, coming up soon surrounding the inaugural UAE T20 League, which is set to feature six teams and 34 matches, we think taking place in February and March next year. And switching to football, we've seen several other really interesting deals struck over the past few days. CVC Capital Partners had its deal with the Liga ratified just this week, with approval from 37 of the top two divisions' 42 teams enough to see the deal passed. Yes, the private equity firm has spent $3.2 billion to take an 8.2% stake in the league's media rights for the next 50 years. Also, some suggestions that CVC is eyeing up a similar sort of model in France with the LFP, the organisation, of course, that oversees uh, Ligue 1 and Ligue 2. Uh, if we didn't know it already, I think it's fair to say that CVC are a major player. Absolutely. And another emerging player is American technology investment specialist Silver Lake, who have also taken a dive into football this week, investing approximately 130 million Australian dollars for a 30% stake in the Australian professional leagues. It's understood that this investment will be used primarily to expand upon the APL's new digital media platform, Keep Up, which offers a direct-to-consumer experience for fans of both Australian and international football. It's also expected that some of the funds will be made available to clubs for marquee player investments with a specific focus on the A-League women and youth competitions. 
Speaking of specific focus on women's competitions, big news from FIFA this week. They've confirmed plans to unbundle women's sponsorship rights in a new commercial partnership structure. Uh, it's going to be a new model that will allow brands to offer dedicated deals around FIFA's women's football and esports properties for the first time, where previously, of course, they were sold collectively along with the men's assets. And uh, clearly, this is going to provide more flexibility for brands looking to reach their target audience through women's and esports verticals specifically. Yeah, and definitely an interest, uh, an area of interest for major brands at the moment. Just earlier today, early this morning, we have the announcement that Barclays are set to extend their sponsorship for the Women's Super League and begin sponsorship of the FA Women's Championship to the tune of £30 million from 2022 through 2025. And last but certainly not least, bit of news yesterday that the Red Bull Racing Formula One team has agreed a partnership, an intriguing one this, with the Alinghi Sailing team and will challenge for the next America's Cup in 2024. And in doing so, of course, they're going to be taking on once again their old friends at Mercedes F1, who previously announced they're working with the Ineos Team Britannia America's Cup team to bring F1 know-how, expertise and technology into sailing's most famous event. After last week, Ken's incredible and incredibly controversial F1 season finale. Uh, one of the biggest and most bitter rivalries in all of sport right now is about to take to the seas. And forget Red Bull and Mercedes alone, Ferrari could be next. Watch out for a potential tie-up uh, in the coming weeks between them and the Luna Rossa sailing team as ties between the America's Cup and F1 grow even further. And definitely one to look forward to after the year those two have given us uh, in F1. Um, now on Leaders Live, it's time, on t it's time for today's big question, which is... How can you make gamification work for you? And that, of course, is a way into a discussion about how to engage your existing fans and entice new ones through games or game-like systems, from fantasy sports to loyalty bonuses, and even increasingly partnerships between sports organisations and existing gaming properties. It is, and today there's, uh, today there's more options and avenues to gamify your sports offering than ever before, and with its effectiveness proven across a number of industries and a variety of projects, you don't want to be missing out. So more on that in a moment from Eleven and from NASCAR, but first let's bring in our resident expert for the afternoon, and it's a pleasure to once again have with us Phil Sharp, COO and Managing Director of Infront X. Phil, good to see you. Great to have you uh, with us again. Uh, we are talking gamification today. Um, in private email correspondence with me, Phil, you uh, suggested that gamification was a terrible word, uh, but an interesting topic. So give us your, before we get into the conversation, give us your top line take. <laughs> Thanks, David. Good to see you again. And Cameron, good to see you again, too. Good to um, see you, Phil. <laughs> hey, bud. Thank you. Uh, it, yeah, the, the word itself, I think, gets thrown around, around a lot these days. I heard of it years and years ago when I was actually building some educational DVDs. And at that time, the idea was to take concepts from gaming and embed them into education and training in order to kind of motivate and engage people to do things that they would struggle to do otherwise. And then I saw it in uh, what I would call high school and junior school education when gaming elements were brought in to teach math and other topics. I think today now it's definitely graduated into the top leagues and it covers a whole plethora of concepts. Um, I see things where it refers specifically to gaming, i.e. embedding gaming into experiences so that when there isn't a live event, we continue to engage and motivate fans. I see elements of gaming being introduced into live event coverage in order to provide another level of engagement. And uh, I think the thing, the challenge I see is trying to figure out what the value proposition is. What is the exchange of values? Who are you doing this for and what are the goals? So I'm intrigued as we talk to Eleven and we talk to NASCAR with Guillaume and Nick to understand how they are leveraging this term and what it means to them and what they're doing with it to create value for fans and other constituents. Definitely a very interesting topic and something we'll be getting into throughout the show. But just to situate it, Phil, are there any examples of gamification from the last few years that have particularly stood out to you? <laughs> um, I, th I think 
what I'm seeing, and, and so you've got to differentiate between sports, I think, too. You know, some sports are full on, all the time on. Other sports have natural breaks in them. And what I'm seeing is people taking uh, uh, leagues, associations, teams taking advantage of those breaks to continue to engage fans and to increase the level of engagement with fans. I mean, the most obvious thing that's taken place over years is fantasy gaming. And we've all seen with clients and, 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 and other partners significant increases in engagement metrics um, through fantasy gaming and interest. Now that translates into a topic we've talked about before on Leaders Live, you know, the betting, the gambling side of things. But I also think there's a dimension, and we're going to cover this today, that I really appealed. For example, Nick and NASCAR, I think, were at the forefront when we hit the pandemic and live events went away of bringing esports in there, of bringing truly what in the old days we would have called gaming and, 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 and competing and, and competing with others to substitute in a way while there wasn't live events and to continue that engagement. And I think Nick may talk to this. I think they increased their fan base by doing that. And I think that's a good example of it. And then um, I see many sports and leagues now providing simple gamification like polls, uh, voting and challenging. And I'm also seeing this point system more and more coming out, especially in Europe, frankly, where by taking particular actions and physical and digital experiences, um, fans are being rewarded. They, uh, they, they accumulate points and then those points are redeemed for different uh, either digital or tangible physical assets with the club, with the league or whatever. Uh, similar to what used to have with the supporters club, you know, prior to digital. So those are examples I've seen that impress me. And I think they're creating a lot of value for fans and for the leagues and teams and associations. Fantastic. Lots to dig into there. Phil, you'll be with us throughout the show. Um, and you've segued perfectly for our first guest. Let's bring in our first guest now. And how about an expert view from over the pond in the US? Uh, one of the earliest adopters of a partnered e-league and often on the cutting edge of the latest gamification trends. NASCAR have never been shy to steer into the skid and embrace new ideas in the pursuit of better experience for their fans. Joining us on the line to tell us about the projects of the past and also their plans for the future is Nick Rend, Managing Director of Gaming and Esports at NASCAR. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. And Phil, I love that intro. I was saying to one of our comms people, should I bring this up? And she said, no, don't even bring up the term gamification. So I'm glad that you took the lead there. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to throw it right back to you then, Nick. I'm sorry that you were told not to speak about gamification, but I'm going to open up by asking, what does that term mean to you? Because it's one of those terms that seems to mean different things to whoever you ask, whoever in the industry. Uh, what, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I think like Phil, I agree that broadly it means a bunch of different things, but how we lean into it, like gaming has been a part of our DNA for, for decades here, not only from a licensing standpoint, but uh, from providing accessibility to fans. We've, we've said for years that you can't go into your backyard and play NASCAR, but this gives us a way to, to lower the barriers of entry to the, to the sport, to get kids involved that ultimately capture their, in, their imagination. So. For us, we really lean into three core pillars on how we measure and, and lean into gaming. So it's reach. How can we reach people uh, where they are in an authentic and organic manner? Uh, relevance, right? Uh, we want to be relevant where young people live, and that's their games, social media feeds, mobile devices, computers, etc. And reputation, like we want to be known, and thank you so much for the warm intro, we want to be known for taking chances in emerging spaces to drive and foster additional growth that ultimately disseminates our brands, our brand and, and, and our form of racing to new eyeballs. Uh, but ultimately, for me, this is a powerful medium that we can that, that we will continue to leverage for years to grow fan engagement, foster a sense of community. Uh, and even in the case of online racing, stand up virtual versions of our sport. Uh, like when, when the pandemic shut live sports down. So for us, it's, it's a critical vehicle to drive reach, relevance, um, reputation, and, and ultimately revenue. Nick, it's the, it's, as you um, eloquently put it there, it's the, the quest for new fans um, 
with, with a lot of this stuff, whether it's broadcast enhancements or, or other elements. And we're going to talk about a particular project that I, I know you've been working on and it is close to your heart involving uh, Roblox in a moment. But um, there's obviously a, a very, you know, like with all sports, NASCAR has, has a traditional fan base of, of hardcore, avid fans. How do you think about all this new stuff in relation to those fans who might be a bit, uh, how can we put it, resistant to change? Uh, no, that, that's a really good question. And, and first, I'll say that running a sport, uh, being a stakeholder in a sport league um, and making games, these are all very hard things. There are three billion people that play games. They all don't want a simulation style version of football of soccer, of racing. They're going to engage with your brand differently. I, I think it's critical for us uh, as a sport league and uh, as stakeholders in the sports industry to be core to who we are. But again, the way that we go to market in these different platforms is going to be different. And, and I think that uh, the fan base that we typically segment into core, avid, and casual fans, it's the same thing that game publishers see. Uh, People like EA, like 2K, like motorsport games, they're going to do their best to build a core product that that is a simulation, a replication of their brand to engage hardcore fans. But like any business, they too are trying to grow. And that means that sometimes they have to bend the rules to lower the barriers of entry, to gamify, if you will, to throw it back to fill, um, to have some more freedom and flexibility to capture and inspire people's uh, imaginations that might be outside of the simulation of the actual sport. Uh, that gets more people into the funnel. And I think broadly the approach that we take in the space is similar across platforms, whether it's hardcore with iRacing, a core product for motorsport games, crossover titles like Forza and Gran Turismo, or exploring casual audiences like Roblox uh, and Rocket League. There's something for everybody. And I think it's mindful. I think we have to be mindful of feedback from the fans. The fans are how we get better. And I love, I actually love watching the interplay between the challenge that the, the fans throw on the publishers and how the publishers respond. For me, I think this is a birthplace of innovation that both sides challenging each other will drive new opportunities for us and how we go to market, whether that's where we go to market, the type of cars that we race, uh, or who, frankly, is racing in our vehicles. But yeah, there's there's always going to be people that are unhappy with something that you're doing. That's part of making games. That's part of running sports. It's part of being a global brand. Yeah, right. I'm part of life, some might say. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you talked about inspiring the imagination of your fans. You talked about innovation there. Could you tell us a little bit about NASCAR's recent collaboration with Jailbreak and how did that collaboration come about? How do you feel it's, how do you feel it's went so far? Yeah, look, so uh, I think of, of the three billion people that play games, about hundred and between 150 million and 200 million monthly active users are on Roblox. So as a marketer, as a big brand, we want to be where the eyeballs are. This is a massive, massive installed base of consumers. These folks are playing on average 2.6 hours per day. That's, that's you know, uh, what almost two of every waking hours. 50% of the demo on this platform is over 13. So as a marketer, uh, as a sports league who is challenged with getting older, why would you not be looking at this space? So, so Roblox is on our radar in a very big way. Uh, why Roblox is important to NASCAR is, look, it's, it's going to help us get younger. It's going to help us expand the brand and bring NASCAR to, to non-endemic games. Roblox is a really accessible platform. You don't have to have a PC. You don't have to have a mobile device necessarily. You can play on console. It's ubiquitous. It, it's everywhere. The Roblox platform gives us the opportunity to learn from these metaverse style concepts, the idea that there's a virtual version of yourself that's going to go into this platform and interact with content differently. So it was a really interesting way for us to lean into this concept and figure out how people engage. Uh, but obviously, we're all in the business to make money. So for me, it's a top of the funnel opportunity. If I can get in front of younger consumers where they are in an authentic and organic way as they as they grow in their journey as gamers and as sports fans, they will look for more ex immersive experiences, whether that's uh, on a Forza, on a Gran Turismo, whether that's a simulation of NASCAR in motorsport games, or whether they want to compete at the highest level in iRacing. This is, this is pipeline to the future generation of growth. Um, but that's, 
this platform is really unique. So we, we wanted to make sure that we created a virtual presence that connected authentically and natively in a, in a really high quality way. Um, but the, the challenge for us on this platform, quite frankly, was how do we make NASCAR feel cool uh, to a bunch of kids that might not know who we are? It didn't feel right for me to go into Roblox like some others have done and just stand up an apparel store and say, here we are, come buy our stuff. I think that we have to figure out how to meet them where they are uh, in a way that was really authentic and organic. And so we determined that an iterative approach in Roblox was the right way for us to go about standing up a presence there. And uh, we wanted to collaborate and make noise with a big game. The Jailbreak guys, two developers, have built this game that 20 million kids are playing every month. Uh, it's an absolute hit. The game is really similar to the Grand Theft Auto series, although it's it's a bit, uh, we'll call it sort of a Hasbro version of the Grand Theft Auto series. Grand Theft Auto is one of the most popular entertainment franchises in history. So uh, it's a proven game mechanic for us. Race cars are a part of how you escape and run. Um, and it's full of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Uh, and not only that, it's led by by developers that that audience trusts. And, and I think that all of us are challenged with how we go to market in front of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Uh, and we're really mindful of how they can critique brands they're really sensitive to being sold to and this is a way for us to be led into the platform by two developers that people trusted um and the way that we captured their imagination was we made our brand part of their life we handed over our ip to them we're launching a next gen race car and we we went to the community and say we're building this new car how should it look and what that did is it incentivized the community to build skins to post skins in reddit uh, it allowed Jailbreak the opportunity to get to know the creators in their community. It filled social media feeds with our content and we didn't pay for any of it. It was a really brilliant activation. Um, and we became, we were able to sort of, I'll say it, um, hack our way into social media feeds in a really natural, organic way. Um, and it paid a lot of dividends and I'm sure that, that we'll talk about the success in a minute. Well, let, let's talk about it now, Nick. I mean, how are you measuring success? I imagine, well, you suggested a, a bit of a test and learn approach inevitably to a platform that is uh, not only new to you, but evolving itself. Um, what are your key criteria at the moment? And, and what do you expect those key criteria to, to be maybe in a year or two's time? Look, I, I think right now it's much less about revenue and it's much more about the other R's uh, that I talked about earlier. It's about reach. It's about relevance. Um, it, it's not so much about revenue right now, but what we're doing is sowing the seeds for future success. So the metaverse, and, and I know that we're all being bombarded by this, by this term daily, it means different things to different people. For us, this is the best working example of the metaverse. And, and being able to just learn how to connect, engage with the community, to see how they interact with our brand, to be able to tap into their imagination. Um, one thing I love about this platform, quick side note, is, is Matthew Ball, who is, is sort of a leader in, in the metaverse talk um, from an influence standpoint. He often talks about how in the 70s when Star Wars um, was a massive success, kids would be in their backyard recreating scenes from Star Wars and there was no way for Disney uh, or, or I should say Fox and um, and Star Wars to tap into that imagination at the time. This platform allows brands to do that and we'd love that. So we're very much playing the long game, but back to the success. So a couple of key KPIs that I'll talk about here. So the, the launch that we made off platform, the announcement we made off platform on Twitter had 2 million impressions. Uh, within 10 minutes of the jailbreak uh, NASCAR event going live, we had 40,000 people playing the game together at once. There were 6 million sessions played in the opening weekend alone. Jailbreak saw a, and remember, this is a, a game that has 20 million monthly active users. They saw a 40% increase in concurrent users over those 10 days and, and had over 24 million sessions. So uh, it was a massive success, not only in terms of engaging the community, giving back to Jailbreak, um, providing some really interesting brand case studies that Roblox uh, CEO Dave Bazuki talked about on CNBC's Mad Money. Um, by all accounts, it was it was a success that we hopefully that hopefully 
uh, informs our board and other industry stakeholders of the power of this platform and how we expect to grow and expand in it in 2022 and beyond. It's really interesting to hear you talk about sort of the power of that platform <clears throat> and sort of in terms of sort of brand partnership. We've also seen other things uh, using Robots as a platform. We've seen music concerts take place via the platform. Where do you see the opportunity for sports in this area? Look, I think that all of us here are aware of how content works on these platforms. As the platforms grow, the demand for content, live content, it's reasonable to expect that it's going to grow also. I, I won't sit here and say that we're seeing Amazon pick up rights for sports content, live sports content. Will we see Epic through Fortnite? Will we see Roblox pick up live content? I think it's natural to expect that that's going to happen. And for me, that's really fascinating. I think in the short term, we might be able to test concepts with our broadcast partners uh, or on, on our own with content that we have the rights to and stand up virtual viewing parties and measure the success there. But I think it's only natural to, to, to expect that, um, that anybody in sports who's producing live events and disseminating content will look at these platforms given their sheer scale and stand up a, a virtual viewing experience in, the, in them as well. Perhaps we will uh, arrange for uh, one of the editions of Leaders Live next year to uh, take place within uh, Roblox. Not a bad idea. Uh, Phil Sharp is listening in keenly to all of this. <laughs> Phil, let's bring you in um, because uh, th this is really sort of next level stuff. Well, we say that, of course, but it's happening. It's, it's, um, it's real. It is real, even though it's virtual. Um, and beyond finding enormous new audiences uh, who are active on these these new uh, generation platforms? There's a a huge commercial opportunity here, isn't there, for for brands? There is. I, I like what Nick said, though. I like David. I, I like the way Nick presented it. And Nick, I I think you did a great job of helping everybody understand how you position this, what you've achieved, and and the success. I think there's some real key takeaways there. But I think from a commercial perspective, I like what you said about, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, but the revenue will follow. The commercial opportunity will come. I, I, I think you targeted a specific audience. I think you found the right platform to engage them. And this is people need to recognize that when you do something like this, it's not a me too or a, oh, I wanna do that too kind. You really have to plan these things out we saw it on the last Leaders Live with the 100 and the way they went about their marketing. I think you saw then, you've seen a lot of what I'm going to call side benefits, things you didn't expect that you quickly accelerated and leveraged. And I think having done all of that, yeah, you're going to have commercial opportunities that are going to be sponsors involved with this. Your commercial partners can be involved as you go forward. But also, I think you're going to need to balance that with your true thing, which was let's let's do a value exchange with this specific group of fans. I think you've targeted a great group because we all know that when we're young, the sports we engage with at that age stay with us for the rest of our lives. As you know, I've, I've been associated with NASCAR for many years and I, I think this is one of the truly, one of the truly innovative and really forward thinking things. And I do think it will give you commercial opportunities. David, I think that space has yet to be explored but I would advise people, don't put the revenue and the commercial opportunity first and foremost, put the value exchange with the fan first and foremost. The other thing I would say based on what Nick and the team have done, I think, and, and Nick, you raised the word or the term metaverse, so I'm gonna reuse it now. It's, it's, it's everywhere, right? It's ubiquitous. But I think what we're going to see over time, and this talks to the sport engagement and the sport events. It also talks the commercialization. And you mentioned this a little bit when you said you don't need a PC, you don't need a mobile phone. I think the interface into sport experiences is going to be through gaming platforms and gaming engines, which will be known also as the metaverse, the gateway to the metaverse, and not be web browsers and mobile phone apps and things like that anymore. I think we're gonna see a tremendous shift and I think it's very, gonna happen very quickly. And I think the folks who want to partner with brands like yours on this need to understand that and figure out 
how to get involved and to focus on that. So I think commercialization will come, David, but I think first and foremost, the properties have to focus on the aspects that Nick pointed out. I think that's key. Well, we're, we're running out of time uh, slightly, um, Nick, but I did just want to ask you one more question before we uh, have to let you go. And that was around where you're seeking your inspiration from. Um, what are the what are the gamification projects? What are the initiatives that you're seeing inside sport, outside sport that are catching your eye as somebody who's in the thick of this on a day to day basis? Uh, I love what Nike is doing. I love what Nike is doing. Um, not only from a, a Roblox standpoint, but exploring the Web3 space. Um, I think like all things, they're, they're leaders. For me, what I really love about this world is the opportunity to bridge the physical and the digital. So the idea of somebody buying a, a race car skin and having it show up as a die cast car or buying a, a piece of virtual uh, apparel or a piece of physical apparel at one of our events, having that show up in the metaverse, I'll call it, whether that manifests itself in Roblox or something that we might do with Epic or in Rocket League. I think these things are really fun and interesting to think about, but like in many things, Nike, I feel like is a leader in the space. Uh, we've had the opportunity to speak with them. At their, their, uh, we hold them in such high regard here and I'm watching what they're doing on a daily basis and hope that one day, back to Phil's point, that there will be a version of a NASCAR world. And by taking the bold steps that we're taking, and we're taking them with our own brand, I might add, and we're doing that for a reason. <laughs> we want to take on the risk and prove out this business model so that our corporate partners can lean into the space that we help cultivate, which ultimately drives more value back to the NASCAR, to their partnership with NASCAR. So. For me, it's Nike. I love what they're doing. I fear, Nick, we have only uh, been able to scratch the surface here, but it has been great to scratch that surface with you and uh, really appreciate your time. And thank you for uh, explaining uh, to us the, the great work you're doing um, on uh, with Roblox and on Roblox. Uh, Nick Rend uh, from NASCAR, thank you ever so much. Thank you so much. And as we've been discussing, the topic of gamification is one of the most interesting but difficult to define areas of the industry. We did our own deep dive on the topic of gamification along with LFP, who were the first domestic football league organiser to start their own partnered e-league, uh, that's e league uh, five years ago. Um, domestic Football League, I, I should say. Uh, download your copy of that report via leadersinsport.com forward slash gamification to find out more on the organisation's strategy and for best practice on consumer interaction in the digital age. Indeed. Uh, so we have heard a, uh, a US perspective on gamification and who better to carry on the conversation than Eleven, one of the most innovative uh, sports media companies out there. Uh, we are going to hear a view on gamification and how it is being deployed uh, by hearing from Guillaume Collard, the uh, Group Chief Rights Acquisitions and Distributions Officer at Eleven Group, also Managing Director of Eleven Belgium and Luxembourg. Guillaume, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you've got a very long job title uh, there, which we've done our best to uh, read out. Um, and we're going to, I know you've been listening into the conversation with uh, Nick and NASCAR, and we're going to start with the same question because, from a, a broadcaster standpoint, what does the term gamification mean for you? And Guillaume, we need to, I think we need to unmute your mic so we can hear you in all your glory. Yeah, thank you. There you first go. All, thanks, for, uh, thank you first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, and I think before answering your question, I think it's, um, my part will be very complimentary to to what has been uh, said about about NASCA and the perspective of, of, of rights orders vis-a-vis -vis basically what, what what we are doing. So I think for Eleven, gamification is gamification is about um, and is part of a much broader, I would say, strategy, which is fan engagement. Um, because for us, you know, our business model is quite simple. You know, we we buy we buy rights, which most of them are live live matches. Uh, we produce channels and we distribute the channels, but I think the key challenge and what we have been very, working very hard and we have learned a lot during COVID last year uh, when basically all live matches uh, were suspended. Um, the key challenge in the future will be 
how much of the time of the fans can you grab when there is no and no live events? Um, and I think we have been quite successful uh, over the past few months. And basically, I think it's part also of of the DNA of Eleven is is to invest a lot of of, of resources in in, in fan engagements, um, in fan activations, um, and gamification is a wonderful way to do that. Well, it's great you mentioned that because, of course, Eleven have been developing a number of new ways for fans to engage with sport. Of course, there was the Watch Together tool and the Eleven Dream Team partnership with Panini. Um, could you tell us a little bit about one of the projects that you've been particularly excited about seeing come to life, whether it's one of those two or, or another? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, last year we, um, we, we acquired the, lo the, the local <coughs> leagues here in Belgium. Um, big investment, one of the biggest projects ever for Eleven, and then all of a sudden uh, COVID came in. Um, and as part of the strategy, we really realized that we need to engage on a daily basis with, with, with fans. And, you know, every, everybody knows Panini. Um, um, you know, when I, when I was five years old, I, I was, you know, I was playing with those cards. Um, and through gamification, actually, and with Panini last year already. So we, we did two very interesting projects last year was about creating, thanks to the stickers, digital stickers, creating your dream team, your, your best team ever of, of, of Belgian players. Um, and very rapidly, you know, we realized that we, we didn't attract only young people. We, we really attract people like, like me who when, when, when they were five years old, six, seven, eight, they were just playing with those stickers. Um, and it was a massive buzz. So this year, I think it's not that we did even better, but I think very complimentary what we launched, um, I think two weeks ago, and it has been a huge success. Um, we, we teamed up again with, 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 with Pro League and Panini to find basically the most iconic shirts in the history of Belgian football. So we collected shirts over, you know, I think 20, 25 years. Um, we are all, all are available in, in digital, so you basically can vote. Um, we had in less than 24 hours, 20,000 votes, um, and it has been growing um, and growing. And, and it's, it's really cool to see that then you really create that, that link, that engagement you want as a um, media group. Obviously, we have many, many hours of live content uh, all, all, all spread all over the week. Uh, but when, we, when you, 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 you manage to create that emotional link with, um, with your fans, I think it's, 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 it's really crazy. It's, it's, really, it's really good. So in that way, gamification is a very good example of, um, of how we can, we can engage and, and, and manage that relationship with, with, with our fans. Uh, Guillaume, thinking about the um, the live broadcast um, innovations that you've you've worked on, Watch Together is is probably a prime example of that. What's the decision making yeah. process? What's the decision making process in terms of figuring out amongst so many options, so many new technologies, so many potential ways for fans to consume the product? How are you making those decisions? I think it's 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 quite it's quite easy to to make such a decision. It's it's basically based on on the needs of your fans. So basically, who is not interacting with any friend when you are watching a live soccer game, or when basically on Sunday you were you were watching to to Hamilton and Verstappen. You know, I was all the time busy with 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 my with my iPhone trying to you know to tease friends or just to have to have fun or to be you know. To be, you know, no, not knowing what what would be happen, um, what would be happening. So, I think the watch the watch together feature is basically a fantastic feature just to interact and be being able to watch games even if you are not in the same room uh, with your friends. Um, and it's it's a fantastic feature which is part of our OTT strategy. Um, and it 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 just on the spots of the need of, of, of fans. Um, I think an, another good one we, we launched last year, completely different, is um, again, also in Belgium, we, we, we have been the first channel introducing um, augmented reality on the pitch. 
So you, you often see augmented reality in studio shows, etc. So basically, we, we brought it into the pitch, um, playing with the data, um, introducing, you know, some, um, some discussions with guests. Um, and it has been, fun it's, it's fantastic. And I really like it. It's, it's again, adding a lot of value to your program um, by adding here and there some very nice features. Um, tell us, um, Guillaume, what do you think, and Nick touched on this from a, a Roblox point of view, but what can broadcasters like Eleven, which is uh, a streaming service, learn from platforms like Twitch, like Roblox, uh, from games like Fortnite, especially in terms of that audience fan interaction? Uh, for, first of all, I think what's, what's very important is, is not to try to, to, copy, to, to copy or to, to go into the business which is not yours. So I think what, what's really key is to, to understand that gamification is, is, is basically a tool which is very complementary to, to what you do. Um, what you see is, um, is, is the level of engagement that such platforms can drive uh, and can also maintain. Um, but even more important, I think it's what are the best practices in, in this industry that you can reuse in order, you know, as I, as I explained, to make sure that you keep, ha you keep having that relationship even when you don't have any live content. Could you give us a success story about a time that a new innovation from your end worked even better than you expected? I think I, I, we mentioned we, may, we mentioned a, 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 we mentioned a few ones. Um, uh, I think constantly innovating with including data um, in, 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 into the live into the live broadcast. I think is 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 is, is really is really fantastic. Um, I remember the first time I, I I told myself we have to do something like this is you know when I was watching Eden Hazard. Uh, before before shooting a penalty, you you just could see it, the, the past penalty he had where 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 basically what he was he was shooting, um, and it's actually it's quite easy to it's quite easy to 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 do. You just need the, the right data and then to implement in order to add to add uh, to add value to your program. And um, obviously, a lot of what we have been talking about today. Um, sort of blends into esports. And I know something that Eleven's parent company, Ace Ventures, has been doing in the esports space is particularly interesting. Tell us a little bit about Shinobi Esports and sort of where that fits and where you see that fitting from yeah. an Eleven point of view. Yeah, again, I think it's very complementary to, I would say, the, 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 the business of Eleven. Um, so Shinobi Sports is, a, is our sister, sister company. It's a joint venture. Um, between our parent company Ace of Ventures and one of the leading esports company in, in, in the world, uh, a, Swed a Swedish company uh, called uh, Ninjas in Pyjamas. And basically, Shinobi helps partners, uh, including, of course, Leeds United, to launch and manage um, their esports uh, organization. Um, I think every club, every club in the world, try to try to do something with this. And as I said, it's very complementary to then the broadcast, the broadcast side of it. Um, we were eleven was also in many territories the first um, sports media company to broadcast esports on TV, not digital, but on TV. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, a, a kind of example of successes during COVID. What we what what we did. Um, so we, we, we have NBA in some territories and we know that some athletes um, and, uh, for instance, uh, Thibaut Courtois from Real Madrid is really an NBA fan. And basically we organized an NBA esports game with him that we broadcast it on online. Uh, and it perfectly makes the link with obviously Belgium because we operate in Belgium, but also with the, with, with the rights we have here, which is NBA, with an emotional link, which is playing with, 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 with Thibaut Courtois. Um, so in that sense, I think Shinobi, again, is very complementary um, and it allows us you know, to, to leverage all assets we have within the group. 
Graham, we've got time for one final question. I'd love to bookend uh, this chat the same way we did with Nick and ask you the same question. Um, who are you looking at that impresses you? What, what else where is inspiring you? Is it someone like the NBA or, or you know, who's doing this kind of thing well? I think in, in something completely different um, and again based on when you analyze what you want as a, as a consumer, I think what Zwift has been doing over the past few months is, is, is incredible because it mixes um, the need for, you know, it's raining, I'm not going to go uh, outside to, um, with my bike. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I miss, I miss doing that because it's, it's, it's raining and I miss the interaction with, with, with my friends. And all of a sudden, you can do pretty much the same thing inside with, with a very cool application. I, I think it's, 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 it's really incredible. Um, and they keep, keep innovating. It's not only Zwift, it's, 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 it's other softwares like companies like Ruby and so on. Uh, and I think that one is, is, is really good. Guillaume, it's super as always to talk to you. Thanks for giving us your time today. Thank you. That's Guillaume Coyard of Eleven Group. Super stuff. Um, let's bring Phil Sharp in, who I know has been uh, listening in uh, intently as ever. And Phil, um, give us your give us your summation of, of what we've heard. You know, we can only hope to scratch the surface on on a topic as as mm. big and broader as this. But really interesting, I thought, to get Guillaume's view from a, a broadcaster's, albeit a new uh, a new generation broadcaster standpoint on on how even they as a technologically advanced sports organization appearing over the wall to that world of gaming for, for inspiration. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you, David. I, I really enjoyed Leaders Live today, to be honest with you. I thought you got two very good perspectives, one from the association, as you said, one from the broadcaster. I think Guillaume a couple of times mentioned, you know, how do you fill that space? How do you engage people when there isn't a live event? That is always a challenge for a broadcaster. And he gave great examples of him partnering with rights owners on how to do that. But also going back to your earlier question, how to commercialize this? Because a lot of partners want to uh, participate. They want to engage the fans of a sport and he gave examples of how they are doing that. And I think everyone who's in the broadcast space and may even be in a space where they don't have the wherewithal to do all, all this on their own, they can partner with a broadcaster or partner with an agency or someone to bring uh, sponsors, other commercial partners to the table and create a very simple gamification type event like a poll um, where we, you know, we had the shirts um, or like a vote or a bracket of some kind that people get very engaged in. And these media owners have those assets to populate those. They're very easy to stand up. They engage fans and it provides a great commercial opp opportunity. So, but you said it, we can only scratch the surface as we started out saying, this is an, a, a very, very broad subject. And I think the, the, two, the two guests today did a great job of showing us different dimensions to that. So. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Phil. And, and it's been our pleasure to uh, have you and Infront X with us uh, today, but also throughout the year on uh, Leaders Live. And, and thanks ever so much for all your contributions. It's been great. My pleasure. Thank you again. And that's just about it for this edition of Leaders Live. Thanks again to Phil, Nick and Guillaume and for being with us. That's it for Leaders Live in 2021. We'll be back in January. Indeed, we will. Uh, just before we go, a big thank to a big thank you to all of our guests uh, this year to Infront X, as mentioned. Also uh, important that we thank uh, Dave, James, Henry, and everybody else behind the scenes who has made it happen and put us on air every month. Thanks to you as well for watching. Have a great break. Merry Christmas. Stay safe, and we'll see you next year. Bye bye for now. <laughs>